All right. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone's going okay. Um, and there's not too many in here that are in um, in lockdown. Um, <laughs> I'm Kate. I'm not Igor. Uh, yeah, like I said, I just had to change the account name over. Um, and thank you for joining me tonight to go over. Um, we're going to go over Ethereum 2.0. So sort of what, um, what Ethereum has been like in the past. Uh, what the upgrades are in their different stages and then um, how they'll merge and then we'll go over a little bit on how this will sort of affect DeFi and just sort of the challenges that it aims to uh, resolve that are there currently. Um, now I've got my screen on split screen so if I take a while to respond to any questions that are put in the chat um, I do apologize but I will get to them at the end if I miss them throughout the webinar anyway. Um, so just a little bit about ePocket, as usual, I'll just give a brief little rundown. Um, so we're a Melbourne-based cryptocurrency exchange. Um, we're also function as a digital wallet. Um, so we're actually in the middle of developing our remittance function as well. So our whole, um, our whole sort of vision is to create like one single united financial system. So, um, you know, how at the moment it's the traditional financial system as well as cryptocurrency. And, you know, they both have their, um, their advantages and limitations, I guess. So our aim is to um, sort of merge everything into a centralized place. Um, we implemented our atomic exchange at the start of the year. So this exchange has API connectivity um, to five exchanges globally. Um, so that means that we have the combined liquidity of all of these exchanges in the one marketplace. Um, so pretty much as soon as you place a, a buy or sell order, it's fulfilled straight away. Um, and there's no, you don't have to um, think about the congestion on the blockchain or anything like that, um, because it's all within our own financial ecosystem. Um, so tonight's schedule, um, like I just said, we'll go over a bit of an overview of Ethereum and I know there's a few of you here tonight that um, have joined me for quite a few webinars, so um, you would have learned some of this already, but we'll just go over it quickly for those um, tonight that haven't been to some of my previous webinars. And then we'll go over the Ethereum 2.0 upgrade so we'll go over the beacon chain um, the shards and uh, like the merge of the old and the new I guess and then we'll go over um, what these upgrades mean for DeFi and sort of why they came about in the first place as well so we'll talk ethereum for a little bit um, just for any newbies here so ethereum uh, was originally live in 2015 and it was uh, implemented as a alternative cryptocurrency to Bitcoin. So where Bitcoin acts as a, a store of value, so you can transfer value from wallet A to wallet B, um, Ethereum allows you to, um, it allows for smart contracts. So, you know, you can, you've seen um, non-fungible tokens, um, we've seen decentralized applications. So it's not actually just a store of value, you can actually um, execute um, a smart contract to work. So it automates an entire process. So say if we're going through um, the logistics process, um, it can cut out all of the administration and it, it can cut out a lot of the personal, like all the um, human work of that process and replace it completely with automations on the blockchain. Um, so we'll just go very briefly on the types of Ethereum transactions. So like I said, you can transfer um, a balance. So say from wallet A to wallet B, I can send one Ether to um, my friend or my family. Um, but also there's a couple of other transactions. So I can also complete a transaction to upload a smart contract, which we'll go over a little bit later. And I can also... Um, execute that contract. So I can upload um, the smart contract that I, I want to do A, B, C and D. And then when I'm ready for that smart contract to act and do A, B, C and D, then I can make another transaction which will execute that um, smart contract. So all of these, um, all of these transactions require gas. So um, gas is pretty much like your fee for placing that transaction, like a miner's fee. Um, same with that like Bitcoin has the same thing um, as they currently function on the proof of work protocol, which we'll go over um, in a minute. So I'm just gonna check this 
there's charts. Yep, so, oh, oh gosh, sorry. I'm not sure what I've done with my computer there. All right, so we'll go over smart contracts a little bit. Um, so it's pretty much a code that runs on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and it, its data resides at a specific address on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, similar to how we all have a public key and a private key, which is encrypted on the blockchain, um, and it's personalized specific to your digital wallet. So say if you have um, a digital wallet with Binance, and you had a digital wallet with ePocket, and say you had one with CoinSpot, you would have a different public key and private key for each one of those wallets, even though they're all for Ethereum. So it's a specific address. Um, so where a user contract is, I mean, it's free pretty much. <laughs> um, and it doesn't really use that much data to be on there. To have a smart contract on there, it's a different kind of user account. So it requires data to be on there. <clears throat> I think the best way to describe them is um, well, I've got the, some images here. So where Bitcoin um, is kind of like an ATM, you can think of it that way, and that it has that single function of storing value. Whereas the um, Ethereum blockchain using smart contracts allows for lots of different functions. So it allows for decentralized apps. It allows for non-fungible tokens that um, you know people can purchase rights to like music and um, like artwork and things like that, digital art. Um, so these are all accomplished through the coding of smart contracts. Um, so we'll go over a little bit on proof of work. So proof of work is a protocol that Ethereum and Bitcoin currently use. And it would spend, it's been the OG, it's been the original um, consensus protocol that has been used for blockchain so far. Um, so when you place a transaction on um, on the blockchain, so if you um, purchase an Ethereum, uh, it's encrypted onto a block using a hash. So this block is then sent to um, a lot of different nodes, um, which are different miners. And these miners are distributed randomly around, um, around the world. Um, anyone can become a miner if you have the technical know-how. Um, you know, the finances to buy the computing system and things like that. Um, you will see massive miner hubs that were in, um, in China and things like that, mining warehouses. So these are distributed randomly to um, lots of different miners. Um, so these miners uh, solve an algorithm uh, and this algorithm validates a transaction. So it makes sure it's, um, it's legitimate, it hasn't... Um, been altered in any way and it just puts that hash onto the blockchain. Um, in return for doing this, solving this algorithm, they then receive a reward. So um, it would be in the form of like in the form of cryptocurrency, so in the form of Bitcoin, in the form, form of Ether. Um, and Bitcoin is actually, um, it's halved every, um, every so often. So that's why um, I think I said it in, ooh, which webinar was it? A webinar, I think it was maybe the second webinar, third webinar I ever did. Um, and we spoke about how the number of Bitcoins actually halves. So there's only so many that can be mined in the course of the cryptocurrency. Um, and I think we're getting there to, I think, 20 from the top of my head, 21 million um, is the limit. I think we're at about 18 and a half, but um, there's only so many that can be done. So once this is validated, the block is added to the blockchain um, and then that's when it's distributed across the network. So that's when you can track it on like um, blockchain.com, um, things like that. And you can see the person's public key when they've placed that transaction. Um, so there's a few pros and cons of proof of work. Um, so the pros mainly is that it's reliable so far. So it's been used um, in cryptocurrency forever. Um, and the reason it's used is that because the nodes or the miners are distributed randomly around the world, it ensures uh, the decentralization um, that is, you know, the perks of blockchain. Um, but it also allows for the transparency and it also means that the 
the, the blockchain is unalterable. So um, you can't go back and alter a trend, like a, um, a hash that's been validated onto the blockchain. You'd have to go to each individual node that verified that transaction and change it in order to change that tr transaction on the blockchain. Um, so that's when um, there's a rule of the 51% attack um, comes in. So that's if more than 51% well, um, of miners have the, um, the computational power of the blockchain. It means that they would be able to change the transaction history. Um, but we'll go over that in a, in a little bit. Um, so some of the cons, and this is what has really triggered the Ethereum upgrade, um, is that it limits the number of transaction pr process per second. So this means that you get that con congestion and the congestion then leads to higher fees because people are sort of bidding um, on the mining fees to get the, um, the transaction validated faster. Additionally, it requires a large amount of resources. So to be a crypto miner, you know, you have to have the know-how, the technical know-how um, to solve the algorithm. You need to have the um, computational power um, and it also uses quite a large amount of um, electricity. Um, that sort of rolls into the next one, is that a high amount of skill is required to participate. So um, it can be quite difficult if, you know, you don't have any sort of uh, knowledge about cryptocurrency or, um, or sorry, I was just reading the chat there. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you don't have the technical know-how, you can't really participate. And that limits the amount of miners or nodes that can really validate the transactions. Um, so I've grabbed this from Coindesk because I think it was quite a good infographic um, from one of the articles posted on Coindesk. Um, and it sort of compares proof of work and proof of stake. Um, and so we'll go over what proof of stake is here. So like I just said, um, proof of work is some of the limitations. Um, so it depends on that high computational power, which ends up using quite a lot of electricity. Um, the miners themselves receive rewards, so in the form of the cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin or Ether, um, in order for solving that algorithm. Um, and the, another benefit, um, which is becoming increasingly more, uh, more of a threat <laughs> um, in recent years, is that the hackers, if someone wanted to change the information on the blockchain, um, they would have to have um, the computational power of more than 51% of the network to add that um, either malicious block or to change a block on the network. Um, proof of stake, on the other hand, means that you only need to stake Ether into a, like, into a liquidity pool sort of thing uh, to um, participate in uh, validating blockchain. So it means that you don't need that um, high-tech computer, you don't need those skills, um, you purely just need Ether to, um, to sort of invest into the blockchain. Um, and then depending on how much Ether you invest, uh, you can validate more transactions. Also, the more that you invest, um, obviously the more reward you receive on top of that as well. Um, in terms of the 51% attack, it's also more unlikely because theoretically, if it's, easy, it's, if it's more accessible, you use less resources, um, there's less likelihood of 51% attack because there's going to be more users distributed. Anyone can sort of participate. participate. Um, from an environmental perspective, um, it also requires less energy, which is a massive factor, and that has been a massive drawback um, of the scalability of cryptocurrency so far. Um, so the beacon chain. Now, the beacon chain is already um, in action. It's already, since December, it's been live. And it's separate to the normal Ethereum network that we use to um, make transactions currently. So it involves proof of stake. Um, and I'll have a little bit of an infographic um, in a, another slide, I think, in one or two slides. Um, so we've pretty much got the normal Ethereum protocol that we use now. So that's um, proof of work. And that's what we use day to day to um, send Ethereum somewhere at the moment or to buy Ethereum. Um, but then we also have proof of stake, which is um, a separate 
um, upgrade to the chain and they kind of are aiming to form a V at the moment. Um, so like I said, proof of stake is much easier to participate in. Um, and the overall goal of this upgrade is that um, the more people that join in staking Ether to validate the transactions, the more decentralized the network actually becomes. Um, yeah, you also return um, earn a return on the amount staked. Um, so that means that the, any validator will earn extra rewards from users. So that's even people um, buying and selling um, NFTs, um, using decentralized applications. Uh, so the more scalable, scalable it is, the more rewards people that are staking get. Um, at the moment, like I said, they can't yet validate um, smart contracts or transactions. Um, so that's to come, I think we'll go over it a bit later, but it's towards 2022. So hopefully um, maybe at the end of this year, start of next year, that's their prediction at the moment. Um, so we'll just go over shards quickly and then we can um, we can have a look at that infographic that will sort of visualize the, um, the actual upgrade itself. So shards, um, sharding is actually a, like a computational science thing that's not specific to cryptocurrency. It's more specific to databases, um, but it does apply here. So it refers to splitting a database um, horizontally to distribute the actual load of the database. Um, so kind of like if you had your, your desktop computer at home and it was full of memory. So you, you'd either buy a bigger computer, which would be more <laughs> smarter, but you know, you could buy a second computer. So then you'd put half of the data on the original computer, half on the other, just to um, you know, free up RAM, free up memory, um, that sort of thing. So the beacon chain, the purpose of that, of separating the two, so the beacon chain being the proof of stake and the, um, the original Ethereum chain being proof of work, is that the beacon chain is actually coordinating the different shards. So it's assigning the people that are currently staking into Ethereum to the different um, the different breakdowns of the blockchain that it's creating. So imagine, imagine it kind of like a spider network like, or a spider web. And, in, and it's distributing the stakers as, um, you know, like little water drops on that. So it's trying to distribute um, everything quite evenly um, to allow for um, the whole blockchain to become more scalable and for the transactions to happen faster as well to minimize that congestion. Let's just have a look. Um, so this is the merge at the moment. Um, so we can see uh, we've got the two arrows there. Oh, sorry, I've got something happening with my screen again. Uh, sorry, I think my connection. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, sorry. Um, so the merge. <clears throat> This is the next stage and that's meant to happen in, um, yeah, like I said, the end of 2021, 2022. Um, so we can see at the bottom here, you can't see my mouse, this bottom arrow, um, proof of stake at the bottom with the little plant there and it's going up and to the right. So that's a continuous arrow. So that means that proof of, proof of stake here is separate um, to this top part, proof of work, um, but it's going to continue on in the future. So we've got proof of work at the top here, which is what we currently use. And we can see this cross in the middle. So that's just indicating where proof of work will stop. But we can see um, in this dotted line arrow, the Ethereum history is going to follow through. So that's where that crossover section is where the proof of stake protocol and the Ethereum, um, the Ethereum history will actually um, converge over. So that means that all of these transactions that have happened on the Ethereum blockchain in the past, um, you'll still be able to see them all. Nothing will really change in the sense of the blockchain won't be altered in a, as a historical factor, but the way that it processes transactions in the future will be different. Um, so we'll go over now um, the benefits of DeFi 
or the benefits of Ethereum to DeFi. So essentially, oh, sorry, my screen is tripping out. Sorry about that, guys. Um, <laughs> so um, DeFi essentially at the moment isn't incredibly scalable. Um, and this is, like I said, um, because of the proof of work protocol. So it takes quite a long time for transactions to be verified and validated. Um, and so in that regards, it's a bit of a bottleneck effect on DeFi. Um, like I said earlier, this congestion actually causes um, very high gas fees. Um, so at the moment, um, these figures are from Uniswap specifically. Um, so on Uniswap, it can cost upwards of about $43 to um, supply liquidity to the, um, the Uniswap liquidity pools where um, you you add crypto, well, you invest cryptocurrency into these liquidity pools and you earn a return on these. Um, and in these DeFi um, applications, people can borrow from these liquidity pools at the same time. Um, also, it can cost um, more than 50, I mean, $15 to swap cryptocurrencies on the network, uh, which obviously if you're just looking to send a friend um, like $20 or something like that, it isn't really viable. viable. Um, so unless you're doing massive transactions, you can't really justify spending that much um, to add small amounts of money to the liquidity pool. So this makes DeFi at the moment not very accessible to everyday people. It's more used by people that are, you know, looking to invest massive amounts or, you know, some of the whales um, that are around. Um, and like I said earlier, the proof of stake actually maintains a more decentralized nature of DeFi because there are more people um, on the network. Um, so this implementation of proof of stake. So when this merge happens and you've got like your spider web of blockchain, so it's meant to implement, um, well, the sharding is meant to implement, I think, 64 different Ethereum blockchains um, rather than the um, what's there currently. So this means that um, consider stakers being <laughs> times by 64. Like it, it means that the lag times are going to be cut a lot. And that also means that these gas fees are going to be reduced and that subsequently these costs, um, it's going to be more affordable for people to participate in DeFi. Um, adding the small fish into the, <laughs> into the big pond, I mean, it makes a massive difference. Like if you make something more accessible to everyone, then it's more accepted worldwide and you have increased profitability for everyone um, so it's a total benefit of that one um, so I'm just going to have a look at the chats there Um, I believe, sorry, I believe, Andrew, I believe Etherlite is like a native token. So I'm not sure if it's um, connected to it as such, um, but I do know that Etherlite is an actual um, native token, which are always made on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I do believe that it uses proof of stake um, consensus, consensus protocol as well. Um, so it's definitely um, worth having uh a bit more of a research into um, and sorry look it, it's um david it's definitely a, it's hard to know how it's going to have um effect on those sort of things i mean I think those protocols are more for connecting um, decentralized apps to the Ethereum network. Um, so it's hard to predict, but I wouldn't say that it would have um, too much of a difference um, because obviously like decentralized apps and things are just going to um, increase in number on the Ethereum blockchain as it becomes um, faster to use it. So at the moment, that's a massive problem at the moment is that, um, you know, I think 
a lot of these developers are trying to create their own blockchains um, to take over that, like the, the decentralized app market, the DeFi market and the NFT market. Um, so by increasing the scalability, increasing transaction time, I mean, decreasing transaction time um, and reducing the gas fees, it makes, it definitely makes Ethereum as a whole um, just more competitive for those um, applications as well. And it makes um, the developers, it's more profitable to them in the long run as well. All right, um, so I've just put some of our um, contact details there. So we've got our email, um, our phone number. So that's our Australian phone number. So anyone that's international, I really suggest um, if you have any questions, um, whether it's about uh, the webinar or about ePocket itself, um, to contact us through WhatsApp, just to limit the amount of um, costs associated with having to contact us. Um, we've also got our handles there for our social media. So feel free to um, have a follow and have a suss around. We can also be contacted on all of those pages as well. Um, I just want to say, yeah, thank you so much for joining tonight. Um, I've had a, a bit of well, a month off from the webinars so far. Um, I moved to Canberra and I've been working remotely at the moment. So <laughs> Um, yeah, it's definitely weird to get back into it, which you guys can probably tell, but um, no, I really appreciate everyone coming tonight. Um, and yeah, just shout out, I believe you'll get a survey um, after the webinar's finished or it may have been emailed already. Um, so just uh, if you have any other questions, just chuck them into that survey and uh, either myself or one of the other customer service people will get back to you um, with some further information. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Um, have fun for me, those that aren't in lockdown. <laughs> and enjoy your weekend, everyone.